Okay, I, I'm going to talk tonight about one aspect of food that is um, sometimes uh, a little underexposed, although some people in this room have been t hinting at it. Uh, I want to take it a bit further. Of course, food is uh, nutritional, as we all know, and we know that we need food to stay healthy, kids need food to grow, and we all need food to stay warm and strong and sane. But there's so much more to food than just feeding. Food is ethical, for instance. Every time we place a bag of um, coffee beans or cocoa or whatever in our shopping cart, we, the consumers, decide whether or not the farmer that produced this product gets a fair deal. And his family gets school, schooling and medical care, for instance. And as many of my previous speakers already have stated, and as, it, as I have stated uh, many times before, food is also a very powerful tool in reaching sustainable society. Um, read, for instance, the book Hungry City and How Food Shapes Our Lives by Carolyn Steele. Food, as American food writers Michael Pollan and Jonathan Seffron Power, and also Burke Beer, who, who we saw early on a TEDx talk, uh, state is also a political act. We, as consumers, have political power through our food shopping attitude. With our shopping cart, we decide which way our society turns. But food is so much more than that. So much more than all of this serious stuff that tends to dominate our plates when talking ethical. Food is also culture, its history, its heritage, its celebration, its fashion, its fun. And as we so often forget, it's also love. In many cultures, where people aren't as verbally focused as we are, food is even often the only way people express their love for others. Food accompanies every one of us on our journey from birth to death. From beschuit met muisjes to coffee met cake. On each memorable occasion, there's food to express what we're feeling or celebrating at that moment. In every nation, in every community, food is there at the core of our most important moments in our lives. Therefore, food tells us a story about who we are, where we come from, where we're heading and with whom. Food, apart from all these things and all these occasions, food is oral history. Um, all this is too often forgotten when we're busy with sustainability and ethical side of food. But it's exactly those features of food that are the tools to develop a new sense of awareness within the next generations. As René Redzepi, the famous sustainable foraging chef from Copenhagen, stated yesterday in The Observer, what we eat matters. There's no conflict between a better meal and a better world. Why shouldn't ethical food taste great and be enjoyed, just like maybe non-ethical food? With this in mind, I'd like to add a very powerful side of food, a side which has been neglected for the last 50 years or so. The years in which our society has become more and more individualistic, and as a consequence of that, food has become less and less a social act. Tonight, I want to advocate that other side of food, food as a social act, and a very powerful one too. One we've sort of forgotten about our, uh, during our individualistic hiccup. The last 50 years or so, the sole aim of our economies seem to have been convenience. Every act of innovation in whatever part of society, from transportation to clothing to home decor to food, seemed to have aimed itself at becoming more and more convenience-driven. This incessant drive for convenience is only one source, individualism. Halfway last century, we came from a society in which we needed the community in so many ways to survive, to bloom, to be who we were, and to feed ourselves. Men needed women to iron their shirts, raise their children and prepare their food, and women needed men to raise the money and pay the rent. 
This became more and more awkward as we became a society in which women and men both started working and in which a family with a father, a mother and a couple of kids were no longer the cornerstone. All kinds of individualistic households started to emerge and they needed a different kind of products. They needed convenience products to feed their individualistic needs. With the convenience products arriving, the need for others declined and even sometimes completely disappeared. Every product hitting the market was aimed at only one thing, to be able to survive on our own in every circumstance, everywhere, 24-7. In a way, this was necessary because we needed room to develop our own selves. But as it went on, it also started to develop a negative side. As individualism grew, we started losing our social awareness. We acquired lots of virtual friends in every world capital, but we didn't know our neighbors anymore. We had become solitary islands in an endless sea. Convenience, as I said, is aimed at the individual. It makes the individual possible to be, work and eat alone. Convenience is hardly ever aimed at a whole community. Is it a coincidence that as we started eating and heating up convenience food, the community started to wither? That butchers and bakers, cheesemakers and coffee roasters, greengrocers and the milkmen all disappeared from our streets? I think not. It made most of our streets empty during working hours, eerily so. Many towns became ghost towns and the feeling of a society got lost in this process. And that's a shame because streets are known to be safer with small businesses like bakers and butchers, coffee roasters and fishmongers around. They are livelier and they are more tolerant. Also, neighborhoods are safer when food is being grown and harvested at or near the premises. There are examples of American pr prisons where the violence amongst inmates was reduced significantly when the inmates started to grow their own food in their prison kitchen garden. When society is built on doing everything on your own, how can you know what others think or feel? When you hardly ever encounter your neighbors, how can you understand or tolerate them? When you don't know your neighbors, how can you and your family feel safe in your own street? For all these reasons, we need to renew our sense of society. We need a renewed community spirit. Both Norway and England in the last few weeks show that the me economy needs to be turned into a we economy again. And as food is a strong tool in reaching sustainability, fairness and ethical awareness, Food is also a strong tool in renewing our sense of society. How? Food is more than anything else a social act. Food can bind people together. Food can even make people, people tolerant. Isn't food often our first encounter with a new culture? Isn't the kitchen the throbbing heart of many a party? Food opens doors and hearts, especially from those around us. Food means sharing, and anyone who has ever had a kitchen garden knows what I'm talking about. Food is about sharing. And as soon as you start sharing food, you start sharing friendships, ideas and understanding. When the changes at the Tahrir Square in Cairo, Egypt started, a food blogger who lived there blogged that the Cairo retailers asked Westerners to still come to the local restaurants and eat there out of solidarity with the locals and to support them financially in those difficult times. To me, this was a whole new take on the local food movement, local food as a social vehicle. Food binds together. Knowledge and sympathy for the others often starts in the kitchen, in the local restaurant, in the community garden. Two recent researchers look at the reasons why primates share food why food is a social act, which is not at all logical from a survival point of view. Adrian Jägi and Kara von Schaik of the Anthropological Institute and Museum at the University of Zurich in Switzerland reviewed studies related to food sharing in primates. 
They found that apart from food as a means of exchange for sex, a very important uh, means, by all means, uh, the main reason is parental investment. A parent wants its offspring to survive and prosper, to enable it to pass on its genes. Food sharing is a matter of survival of our kind. The other researcher, Andrew King of the Royal Veterinary College in London, goes a step further. He followed 14 baboons on foraging trips in the Namib desert. King found that the sharing of food is the way to bond socially. Baboons infest in social safety net by sharing their food. And then there's the growing amount of food scientists that state that eating together is not only social, but also healthy. Marco has talked about that, actually. Um, thanks to social interacting during the meal, the food is better digested. Plus, when you eat together, you will tend to eat more healthy stuff. You will probably be ashamed to serve your guests or family a TV dinner or whatever. And you will tend to eat at the table instead of sitting in front of the telly or the computer or behind the steering wheel. I remember a lecture by the CEO of a Japanese prebiotic drink a couple of years ago. To the audience's complete surprise, he started his lecture with a couple of pictures from his personal family album from his mother who lived in a Japanese elderly home. His point was that, sure, this pre prebiotic drink is very, very good for you, your digestion, but it will only really work if you eat together with your loved ones, if you are embedded in social surroundings. To me, this was really a mind-blowing experience. This CEO that thought past his own shadow, past the marketing aims of his company, past profit gains, in order to deliver a purely social food message. If this CEO of a huge multinational can, then we can too. Luckily, the era of individualism is coming slowly to an end, and convenience products encounter more and more resistance by consumers. More and more social initiatives start to pop up in the streets, on the internet, and in the social media, making the streets lively again. From community gardens, community dining services, and community beehives, to the People's Supermarket in London, I've got a few uh, examples. These are books about, which really struck me, books about food for friends and family. There's a whole series all over the world coming out nowadays, books for food, uh, friends and family, food friendship and kitchen loving, um, community dinners all over the world, good people, ideas and food, uh, the youth food movement in, in uh, Holland, but in other places as well. Uh, the people's supermarket, um, where not some marketing manager is the boss, but the neighborhood is the boss. Um, you've got tweetjemee.nl, that's an online marketplace for food, actually, in the neighborhood. If you, you're not uh, capable of cooking yourself, then you can find through the internet someone in your neighborhood who does cook and who can share his food with you. There is shareatable.org, a very nice uh, website. Um, on, for travelers, when you're traveling alone, you don't want to eat alone, find an eating partner through the internet. There is this Italian website, Home Food, um, where uh, you as a traveler can find families where you can have a proper Italian meal in a real Italian surrounding, which you will never encounter in a restaurant. Um, there is Gobble, this is more or less the same as Tweetjemee.nl, it's an American um, initiative. And you've got Curb, that's not only about food, but it's about neighborhoods. It's about finding people in your own neighborhood and connecting with them in the subject that you need um, in all kinds of ways. A very nice one, Be Neighborly. Uh, then you've got the restaurant in Amsterdam, United Tastes of 1097, that's the postal area code, um, where the interior was uh, brought, to the uh, brought by the neighborhood, 
all the um, uh, chairs and tables and stuff. And the menu is also put together by the neighborhood. So the idea is that the whole neighborhood, um, consisting of people from Suriname or Morocco or Turkey or wherever, they contribute to the menu and the people can eat the food from the neighborhood. And the same people also started the Zuider Markt uh, in the middle of Amsterdam, uh, a market with local produced food, only food from the neighborhood. And um, this is uh, a tight swell. It's a very small place in England that really lost all the shops, everything that made the city lively. And um, they started to, to try to get, get those shops back in town and to start to create a community again <coughs> from a food uh, point of view. Um, Social Ice, uh, this man uh, has a, uh, an ice cream cart and he tells everybody uh, through Twitter where he is and where the community can find him. Very nice one. And this is, um, I found it through someone here in the audience. Thank you very much for that. Culinary incubator. Uh, people with very small businesses who need professional kitchens but cannot afford those. They can find people with professional kitchens and they can be connected and they can have um, use of these kitchens when they are empty uh, during certain days. And this very nice initiative, um, Guerrilla Guarding Lowlands, I think it's next weekend. Very nice one as well. Um, footprint also, uh, it's in The Hague. Uh, a, a food society, uh, an, um, Eight park they are creating, and the first sustainable micro grocery store, which is coming this uh, fall in America, uh, a neighborhood oriented grocery store. So there's a lot and a lot, and let's not forget the initiative which we have heard about uh, already uh, tonight. Um, there's lots and lots of those initiatives to make a community through food again. In all cases, the social eater meets his neighbor. Young, old, poor, rich, alien or not, everybody becomes each other's off and online table partner and the neighborhood becomes not a global village but a local world. Call it Woodstock, like Carlo Petrini, the founder of Slow Food Movement and advocate of food community calls it. Call it punk, like I sometimes do. In any case, be neighborly, food is social. Ah.